David was guilty of this. The prophet pointed to David. David was guilty. What had the king done? How did we get here? It all began when David was about 50 years old and nearing the end of his reign as king. He possessed everything a person could want. When armies were preparing to go to war, David stayed at home. Maybe his general Joab recommended him to come later. David may have told himself that he had done enough fighting. In either circumstance, David stayed in Jerusalem, a sitting target. One evening, David saw a stunning woman bathing. She was Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, one of David's most valiant soldiers. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 3 David sent word and inquired about the woman. Someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Take note of the wording in relation to David. He saw, sent, and took her. These three words are predictable in the sequence of sin. When sin came into the human race in the Garden of Eden, Eve saw, took, and ate. The devil has no new tactics. David evidently ignored that he was a man after God's own heart, with the anointing of God upon him at the time. This would be a one-night stand for David. We must understand that excitement is associated with sin, especially secret sin. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 17. Stolen waters, pleasures are sweet because they are forbidden, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Bathsheba sent David a note with four life-changing words not long after the event. I am with child. David may have believed he could escape his sin, but he wasn't. Our sins always have ramifications. David had a choice to make at this point. He could either confess his sin and ask the Lord for forgiveness, or he could try to cover it up. David resolved to do what God says we cannot do. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but whoever confesses and turns away from his sins will find compassion and mercy. The rest of this chapter describes a tragic tale of how King David, the man after God's own heart, tried to cover up his sin. He first tried to use Bathsheba's husband to create plausible deniability. Then David sent word to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the people were doing, and how the war was progressing. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. Spend time at home. Uriah left the king's palace, and a gift from the king was sent out after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's palace with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not just come from a long journey? Why did you not go to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in huts, temporary shelters, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Should I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Stay here today as well, and tomorrow I will let you leave. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now David called him to dinner, and he ate and drank with him, so that he made Uriah drunk. In the evening, he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his lord, and still did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. 
He wrote in the letter, Put Uriah in the front line of the heaviest fighting and leave him, so that he may be struck down and die. So what happened? That as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew the enemy's valiant men were positioned. And the men of the city came out and fought against Joab. And some of the people among the servants of David fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. 2 Samuel chapter 11 verses 6 through 17. David now had a real problem, which he solved by slaying Uriah. David had progressed from a glance to adultery to murder. One sin has a way of multiplying, and the devil never tells us where our sin will take us. David then attempted to get Uriah drunk. Bathsheba mourned her husband's death until David summoned her to become his wife. David mistakenly believed the cover-up had been successful. However, God was not pleased. David was about to discover the meaning of Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. Your sin will find you out. David played the hypocrite during Bathsheba's pregnancy. The fellowship and communion with God were shattered for the man after God's own heart. People around him were probably wondering what had become of their beloved king. Nathan was sent by God to David. And the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to David. He came and said to him, There were two men in a city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had purchased and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It ate his food, drank from his cup, it lay in his arms, and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler, visitor came to the rich man, and to avoid taking one from his own flock or herd to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for his guest. Then David's anger burned intensely against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall make restitution for the ewe lamb four times as much as the lamb was worth, because he did this thing and had no compassion. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you as king over Israel, and I spared you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house, and put your master's wives into your care and under your protection. And I gave you the house, royal dynasty, of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have given you much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife. You have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will stir up evil against you from your own household, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and in broad daylight. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has allowed your sin to pass without further punishment. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have given a great opportunity to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme him, the son that is born to you shall certainly die. Then Nathan went back to his home, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David, and he was very sick. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1-15 through 15. 
Another life-changing four-word message revealed David's sin. You are the man. David faced the first effect of his sin. He lost his son. David therefore appealed to God for the child to be healed. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. The elders of his household stood by him in the night to lift him up from the ground but he was unwilling to get up and would not eat food with them. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him and he would not listen to our voices. How then can we tell him the child is dead since he might harm himself or us? But when David saw that his servants were whispering to one another, he realized that the child was dead. So David said to them, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David got up from the ground, washed, anointed himself with olive oil, changed his clothes, and went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came back to his own house, and when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this thing that you have done? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But when the child died, you got up and ate food. David said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and the child may live but now he is dead. Why should I continue to fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him when I die, but he will not return to me. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 16 through 23. Many people believe that God's forgiveness cleanses us of the consequences of our sins. They are incorrect. Nathan predicted four outcomes for David. The sword would never leave his house. His family would revolt against him. His wives would be publicly humiliated. And the son conceived with Bathsheba would perish. What was the result of this sin? After David committed the sin of adultery with Bathsheba and slayed her husband, the prophet Nathan gave the king a warning that the sword would never leave his house again because of David's actions. In accordance with the prophecy, David was plagued with marital issues from that day forward, including lying, adultery, incest, and even murder. David never did figure out how to effectively deal with the rebellion. It was almost as if the anointing and authority that had been given to him had been taken away. Sinful behavior or counsel can also be a source of negativity in an environment because they both eventually lead to the establishment of a sinful standard. The story of David's children is evidence of how negative attitudes can destroy so much if they are not dealt with and stopped on time. The Lord had forgiven David's heinous sins of adultery and murder, but he had also warned David that the consequences would be disastrous for David's family. David had committed adultery and assassinated a man. David's numerous wives had given him half-brothers and half-sisters as sons and daughters. David's practice of having multiple wives was about to come back to bite him. The son of David, Amnon, developed romantic feelings for his half-sister Tamar, who was also Absalom's full sister. Amnon's cousin Jonadab offered to help him with his conundrum when he heard about it. Jonadab came up with a cunning plan that would allow him to be by himself with Tamar for some of the time. Even worse, he would enlist the help of David, who was completely unaware of what he was planning to do. The ambush had been prepared. At the request of the royal family, the innocent Tamar was taken to the bedroom of her purportedly ill half-brother. Once they were alone together, she made preparations to feed him. 
On the other hand, he took her and made his intentions crystal clear. Tamar begged him not to bring shame on her by committing such a heinous act, but he ignored her pleadings. If Tamar were to commit this act, not only would she be embarrassed, but Amnon would be considered one of the most outrageous fools in all of Israel. She went so far as to suggest that he ask the king to make her his wife instead. On the other hand, Amnon was not persuaded. Rather, he was adamant about his sin. Amnon, true to his low character, despised Tamar with such zeal that the hatred he felt for her was greater than the love he felt for her after he had violated her. This is because the hatred he felt for her was more significant than his love for her after he violated her. Obviously, his love was nothing more than lust driven by his own ego. This is demonstrated by his response to her after she had asked. Tamar pleaded with him not to abandon her or send her away. Since he was the one who violated her, he should marry her as compensation for taking away her innocence. If she did not do that, she would almost certainly have no other marriage prospects available to her. Amnon just cast her out of the house. Rather than making amends, Amnon compounded his sin as his father had done. Absalom comforted Tamar as if he did not think it was severe, but actually he was already plotting revenge against Amnon. Tamar was comforted by Absalom, but in reality, he had already devised a plan to exact revenge on Amnon. Absalom gave the impression that he did not believe the situation to be particularly dire. Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's home, even though she had done nothing to deserve the shame. Now she would be rejected for marriage. Her situation in Absalom's home indicates that she did not marry and did not have any children before her death. The innocent, as well as the guilty, can suffer harm as a result of lust. Even though David was seething with rage, he did not punish Amnon as severely as he should have, most likely because everyone was still processing David's transgression at the time. He was aware of his responsibility, but he was unable to act. This situation is the result intentional sin has on us, as it robs us of moral freedom and the freedom to speak freely and testify. Amnon was not punished in any way by the king, which came as a surprise. At this point, the reader may wonder if David's moral fortitude had been weakened by his knowledge of his past sexual sin. This is a reasonable question to ask. Regardless, his failure to act was a statement in and of itself. Absalom, on the other hand, would do something. He despised Amnon for defaming his sister, so he waited patiently, hoping for a chance at vengeance. Absalom patiently waited for the right moment to exact his revenge. It arrived after a period of essentially two years. When it came time to shear the sheep close to Bethel, as per usual, there were big celebrations in the works. The urgent invitation that Absalom extended to his father was not accepted, most likely because David wanted to spare his son the burden of costly expenses. However, they successfully brought all of the king's sons, the most important of whom was Amnon, who, as the eldest son, represented their absent father. At a predetermined signal, Absalom spoke to his servants. 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 28 through 36. Now Absalom commanded his servants, Notice carefully when Amnon's heart is joyous with wine, and when I say to you, strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not be afraid. Have I not commanded you myself? And in doing so, have I not taken full responsibility for his death? Be courageous and brave. 
So the servants of Absalom did to Amnon just as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons got up, and every man mounted his mule and fled. Now what happened while they were on the way back home, that the exaggerated report came to David. Absalom has killed all the king's sons, and not one of them is left. Then the king stood and tore his clothes and lay on the ground in mourning. And all his servants were standing by with their clothes torn. But Jonadab the son of Shemaiah, David's brother, responded, Do not let my lord assume that all the king's sons have been put to death, for only Amnon is dead. This act of revenge has been on Absalom's mind since the day Amnon violated his sister Tamar. So now, do not let my lord the king take the report to heart that all the king's sons are dead, for Amnon alone is dead. Now Absalom fled, and the young man who kept watch looked up, and behold, many people were coming from the road behind him by the side of the mountain. And Jonadab said to the king, Look, the king's sons are coming. It has turned out just as your servant said. And when he finished speaking, the king's sons came, and they raised their voices and wept. And the king and all his servants also wept very bitterly. Once more, David was overcome with grief and sorrow. David suffers the consequences of his sin with Bathsheba. The whole thing plays out like a soap opera. David's leadership has shrunk to a mere shadow of its former self by this point. Take note of the following changes in David's leadership. He no longer works proactively, but passively interacts with those closest to him. He no longer represents joy, but is full of grief, despair, and mourning. He no longer acts on his convictions, but buys into rationalizations about his laws. He no longer solves problems, but licks his wounds. He no longer pursues his desires, but remains paralyzed regarding Absalom. The story of David and Bathsheba serves as a sober reminder that even a man after God's own heart can fall into the depths of sin. No believer is immune to falling. David grew into a man whose family had fallen apart. The story of David and Bathsheba can be applied in several ways. First, we are never too old to be tempted. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, well-balanced and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry seeking someone to devour. If David can fall, so can we. Second, while God will certainly forgive our sins, don't take his forgiveness for granted. Third, the Lord offers mercy and forgiveness. When we truly confess and repent of our sins, he will restore the joy of his salvation in our lives, David stated. Pittacus wrote that the measure of a man is what he does with power. When David used Bathsheba for his own selfish purposes, he began a long spiral downward into deceit and adultery. 2 Samuel 11 tells the story of a king who forgot that leaders wield power solely for the purpose of serving. We can learn about common abuses of power by watching King David weave a tangled web following his sin with Bathsheba.